Arizona is home to 22 tribal nations and more than 340,000 Native Americans. Arizona State University builds on more than six decades of working and partnering with tribal nations and communities. Many of our Native faculty incorporate indigenous knowledge systems in seeking solutions through a process of community engagement that respects and honors traditional ways of thinking. Together, we are creating community solutions leading to a more equitable future. Is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tolohungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. 97 years ago this week, Congress passed the Indian Citizenship Act. This granted U.S. citizenship to Native Americans. The act was passed on June 2, 1924, and came 59 years after African Americans were freed from slavery. Prior to the 1924 Act, Native Americans could only gain citizenship by military service or by marrying white citizens. American Indians did not petition the government to grant them full U.S. citizenship. The act was in response to the military service of tribal citizens in the First World War. Despite being granted full citizenship 97 years ago, it did not include the right to vote. It wasn't until 1957 that all Native Americans were able to legally vote. This was due to discriminatory state laws, which prevented tribal citizens from fully exercising their rights. A federal judge is declining to order fireworks at Mount Rushmore this year. The judge rejected South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem's efforts to shoot fireworks from Mount Rushmore National Memorial. Noem sued the U.S. Department of Interior to reverse its decision denying the state's permit for a pyrotechnic display. The governor successfully pushed last year for a return of the event after a decades-long hiatus. However, the return led to a clash between treaty defenders and members of law enforcement. The National Park Service denied it this year, citing safety concerns and objections from local tribes. Nome's lawsuit also reignited a legal skirmish between her and the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. The tribe opposes the event on the grounds that the Black Hills, which contain Mount Rushmore, are sacred to the Lakota people. A totem pole is making its way to our nation's capital with several stops along the way. The House of Tears carvers from Seattle, Washington, are traveling with the totem pole to raise awareness of sacred sites that are at risk of being destroyed or disturbed. The carvers are from the Lummi Nation, and they are stopping today in San Francisco and will be showing the totem pole to people at Pier 39, which is a popular tourist area. They will also be stopping by the Golden Gate Bridge. The carvers have been touring since April and have made stops at more than 50 locations in the Pacific Northwest. At the end of July, the totem pole will be delivered to the White House. And in the fall, the totem pole will be featured at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. Indigenous leaders in Ecuador are gifting a spiritual command staff to the new president. Guillermo Lasso received the staff in a ceremony that was held in Tambo Loma, a community in the Andes Mountains. Ecuador is in South America between Colombia and Peru. President Lasso accepted the baton and pledged to support the indigenous people. Agradeciendo una vez más la entrega de este bastón de mando que lo llevaré con humildad, con dignidad y que servirá para recordar lo importante que es el desarrollo de los pueblos, nacionalidades indígenas y lo importante que es el desarrollo rural y campesino del Ecuador. Lasso is a former banker whose four-year term started on May 24th. The Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma will open its new cultural center next month. The center will help tell the 14,000-year history of the Chata people. The building is situated on 22 acres. It's more than 100,000 square feet and will house two exhibit halls, an art gallery, auditorium, classrooms, a gift shop, and a cafe. Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma Chief Gary Batten says the cultural center is designed as a living, breathing space that contains centuries of the Choctaw journey. 
the center will have a replica of an ancient spiritual mound. The tribe's culture will also be built into the center itself with unique features such as door handles that are reimagined as stickball sticks. And there are also examples of historical Chata crops. Archaeologists in Wisconsin have recovered the remains of indigenous people who lived in the region 2,500 years ago. The excavation site is in Sheboygan County along Lake Michigan. More than 10,000 items were found on land that may soon be turned into a golf course. According to documents obtained by Wisconsin Watch, a team from the University of Wisconsin found ceramics, tools, and other artifacts. To read the full story, visit our website, IndianCountryToday.com, and search for the headline, Indigenous Remains Found at Proposed Golf Course Site. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholohungva. When we come back, we celebrate heroes and warriors. This is Indian Country Today. America celebrated Memorial Day this week. It's a time to honor those who died in battle. Native Americans honor their veterans and fallen heroes in ceremony. This tradition is told in Way of the Warrior, an award-winning documentary by Patricia Lowe. She tells us about the significance of the Native warrior. I think there's, um, there's a lot of pride in Native, um, Native America about the fact that we, we do serve disproportionately um, at rates greater than, than other communities in this country. But there's also confusion that somehow that makes Native people more patriotic. And, and really, you know, in my experience, uh, talking to some of the, um, the veterans that I've interviewed, it was all about serving their country, not necessarily the United States of America, but it might have been the Ho-Chunk Nation or the Menominee Nation or the Creek or Choctaw Nation. Um, but certainly uh, military recruiters have used that warrior ethic um, and, and really, really used it in their, in their campaigns. Um, you look at Native, and, and even in, in, I'm thinking about some of the, um, the video um, commercials and promotional materials that the military has used, they've really, really promoted that warrior ethic um, and, and used it specifically to appeal to Native Americans. Did boarding schools encourage military service for Native students? Absolutely. You know, and at one time, um, I, I'm told that Pershing um, considered putting war paint on, and feathers on frontline Native Americans who were um, volunteering in droves from Indian boarding schools because their lives were very militaristic, drilling in the morning, marching to the dormitories, marching to you know the mess hall, marching to their classes, and so they you know marched right on into the training camps and the front lines of the American Expeditionary Forces, and um, and they were you know <laughs> the military command actually was thinking about putting them in war, war paint and feathers because so many of the Germans had grown up with Karl May, who had written these uh, overly romantic stories about, about Native American uh, warriors, pr primarily Apache warriors. And uh, Germans were, were frightened to death that they were fighting, you know, quote unquote, red Indians. Um, but, you know, because these Native soldiers and there were you know, somewhere between 12,000 and maybe 20,000 Native Americans who volunteered to fight um, in World War I, including my grandfather, who I always thought, you know, stood up there and, and took the oath to defend the Constitution. He wasn't even a citizen. And most of them, you know, most of the others weren't either. And yet they suffered casualties that were five times higher than any other group in, you know, in, in World War I. World War II is the same thing. Um, you see these tremendous recruitment efforts um, coming out of uh, um, Indian boarding schools, the, the 45th um, Infantry, the Thunderbirds that um, drew from, from Cherokee and Choctaw and primarily um, some of the, um, the uh, boarding schools in the, the Southeast and, and it, I'm sorry, in, in Oklahoma. Um, and again, you know, these were that unit was the first to to see action in the motherland in Germany and suffered tremendous um, casualties. Korea um, there, you know, I'm thinking about the story of John Rice, 
who uh, was killed in Korea and um, in heroic fashion came, came back, his body was returned a year later. Um, and during his funeral in Sioux City, Iowa, the cemetery director called everything off saying he can't be buried here because this is a whites only cemetery. And um, eventually he was, he was um, interred in, in Arlington. But, um, you know, it's really interesting, conflicting relationships that Native people have had with the U.S. military. Thank you, Patricia Lowe. She directed the PBS documentary, Way of the Warrior. Athletes are another kind of warrior, and Brent Kawi is the co-founder of the website IndianSports.com. He joins us now to give us an update on Native athletes from high school to the pros. Janae Kasnavoy, um, she's a competitor in the hammer throw event. And uh, a few weekends ago, she competed at the USA Track and Field Throw Festival in Tucson, Arizona. And she set a uh, personal record in the hammer throw um, for 75 and a half meters, uh, which is a personal best for her. Um, she, obviously, she's trying to make the Olympic team in the event. Um, and she had three American competitor, competitors um, finish in front of her. Uh, so now she'll head to the uh, USA Olympic trials in Eugene, Oregon on June 18th through 27th to trying to get that one of those top three spots. Uh, the top three finishers get automatic bids to compete for the USA, Team USA in Tokyo for the Summer Olympics. Um, she's been competing for uh, at a high level for the past five or six years now. She was a junior college uh, national champion. Uh, she was a two-time Big 12 um, hammer throw champion as well. And uh, she's been training with a, a professional trainer for the event uh, at Louisiana State University um, for the past six months and now to try to obviously make the team. I think she has a pretty good chance to get that third spot. She's really going to have to um, peak at the Eugene, Oregon uh, Olympic trials. Um, but if she doesn't, she can be selected as an, uh, an alternative, which means she'll go with the she'll go with the team, but she won't compete. Uh, should, she would only compete as if any of the other competitors got hurt while they were there. Brent, what's happening on the basketball court? We have three Native athletes in the basketball league. Uh, they play for a professional team out of uh, Enid, Oklahoma. They're called the Enid Outlaws. Um, the basketball league is basically a semi-professional league where players can get called up to the G League, which is the um, preparation league for the NBA. And, or also they can be um, directly pulled up from the NBA as well. Um, but the three athletes that we have on the team are Lindy Waters III, who's Kiowa and Cherokee. Uh, he most recently graduated from Oklahoma State University. Um, we also have Wayne Runnels, who's a Cheyenne Arapaho. Um, he played at Creighton University for his collegiate years. And, and then finally, we have Chance Comanche, who is a Choctaw and Comanche, who played at U of A. Um, University of Arizona uh, for his collegiate career. Um, their team has the tied for one of the best records in the league. So they've been one, two, three, the top scorers um, for their program. And, and they've been doing really well uh, since they started playing this season. In the WNBA, we have Chelsea Dungy playing with the Dallas Wings. She's a rookie and like a lot of rookies, um, they're still learning where they fit into the system, uh, where they fit with the other players. Certainly Chelsea is a talented um, athlete. She had a lot of great success at the University of Arkansas. Um, you know, she was a top 10 draft pick. And right now, you know, with a lot of the rookies, they kind of are learning the system and they, they kind of come in and play cleanup minutes at the moment until they can get learned the system. Uh, but she's a fan favorite. She's probably, um, you know, has a really good shot to have a long career in the, in the league. So we're definitely looking forward to following her and her career as it progresses through the WNBA. And finally, what's happening at the high school level? I've been to about three res ball tournaments. I shouldn't say res ball tournaments, but high school prep tournaments in the, in the past month or so. I've been to Oklahoma City, Phoenix, and uh, Kansas. And uh, I ran into a young gentleman by the name of Juju Ramirez, who's from the Turtle Mountain Chippewa tribe. And, um, He's an outstanding athlete playing at a prep school in New Hampshire, and uh, he has a scholarship. He has a scholarship offer from the University of Kansas Jayhawks, uh, which is one of the top blue blood programs in, in all of college basketball. So 
he's a class of 2022 and he's still working on his game, still working to get better. And it was just a good opportunity for me to sit down and interview him and, and um, follow his career as well. Thank you, Brent Cowie. Read more about Native athletes at indiansports.com. When we come back, we'll meet a Native astronaut with some interesting advice. John Harrington is a retired naval aviator, engineer, and former NASA astronaut. In 2002, Harrington became the first Native American to fly in space. Inquiring minds want to know, how do you sleep in space? ICT reporter Caitlin Onawa Boisel finds out. It's no surprise sleeping in zero gravity can feel funky to some. You know, imagine going to sleep for the first time and you're not touching anything. It's weird. So I would squeeze myself up against the wall Former NASA astronaut John Harrington says he was aboard the International Space Station. It was much smaller. There were 10 when I was there, and we were in about a half the size of what the currently have now. But that didn't stop him from finding a comfortable spot to lay his head down. The nice thing is we had these sleeping bags, and I would get in my sleeping bag, and I'd squeeze myself between you know a couple of large storage bags. So I had that feeling of being crushed up against something. It was comfortable for me. That comfort even brought him to unexpected places. Take a nap and just floating and, you know, wake up over here. You know, sleep over here and wake up over there. That was fun. He would sometimes wake up and not even know what time of day it was. Took a nap on the flight deck, uh, woke up looking out the windows at night. It takes 90 minutes to go around the earth. So for 45 minutes, you're in darkness and 45 minutes, you're in sunlight. But when it's time to lay your head down and go to sleep, you sometimes don't expect what you see. And imagine when you close your eyes, uh, you see fireworks. Because there's these you know, high energy particles coming out of the you know, distant universe, coming a whack you in the head, and it kicks off a little, little flash of light in the back of your eyes. So when, you're, when you close your eyes now, all of a sudden you see this little, little, this little flash of light that comes up, and you're like, what was that? Something you can only experience sleeping in space. In Wisconsin, Caitlin Onawa Boisel, Indian Country Today. A Ponca hero is being honored in Lincoln, Nebraska. The Board of Education voted unanimously to name a new school Standing Bear High School. Larry Wright Jr. is the chairman of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska. He relates the story of his tribe. After the, the Fort Laramie Treaty, 1868, uh, and erroneously included our land in, on the Nebraska South Dakota border. And that we had a treaty at that time, and those acres uh, were, were taken away from us. And so our people were forcibly removed uh, to Oklahoma, and we lost many people along the way, uh, our own trail of tears. And, and Standing Bear uh, <clears throat> lost a daughter uh, along the way. And once they got to Oklahoma, uh, his son was dying. And it, one of his, his son's uh, dying wishes uh, to Standing Bear was to, that he wanted to be buried back in the homeland. Uh, his son uh, subsequently died. Uh, many others were, were, were dying of disease and, and elements and, and, and many things. And Standing Bear and about 30 followers at that time decided that they would rather uh, try to get home and were willing to die to come home in, in large part to honor his son's uh, request and the promise that he made to his son. But also uh, they knew, they believed that if they stayed in Oklahoma, they too could die. Uh, and so they just would rather take the, the chance to come home. Uh, they got as far as our relatives, uh, the, the Omaha tribe, the Omaha tribe, and uh, when they saw the condition our people were in and, and making it that whole journey without being caught, uh, they, they kept them there to try to feed them and, and, and rest up. But about that time, the, the military, US military caught up with Standing Bear with the orders that they'd be turned around and, and marched back to Oklahoma right away. And, and subsequently they were detained down at Fort Omaha at the time 
And uh, that's uh, where this uh, trial took place through, which nobody knew at the time, but through the generosity of General Crook at the time. And the irony was that he was known as one of the, the great Indian fighters at the time. Uh, but uh, he, he saw the condition of our people the, and, and what they've gone through. And it was through his uh, efforts behind the scenes uh, to, to bring this to, to a trial. Uh, in fact, he recommended that Standing Bear sue him uh, to prevent the removal and, and others that uh, worked on our behalf. Thank you, Larry Wright, Jr., Chairman of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska. Let's take a deeper look at this story. Standing Bear's Footsteps was directed by Christine Leshek of Nebraska Public Media. It examines the court case. Here's an excerpt. Standing Bear entered the courtroom dressed as a chief, with a wide belt of beads at his waist and a necklace of bear claws. Around his shoulders, wrote General Crook's aide-de-camp John Bork, Standing Bear wore a blanket of vivid red trimmed with blue stripes. This was his council blanket, which he wore whenever he was to speak officially for his people. There was no jury. Federal District Court Judge Elmer Dundee alone would decide the case. The question before the judge was simple. Standing Bear had been arrested for leaving his reservation. Did he have the right to challenge his imprisonment? Did he have the right to habeas corpus? And the key passage is, any person can file a writ of habeas corpus. It doesn't say anything about being a citizen. The law does not use the word citizen. It says any person can file or sue for a writ of habeas corpus. So the only question before you right now is not whether Standing Bear is a citizen of the United States. The only question before you is whether or not Standing Bear is a person. I don't think they were questioning whether he was human, but whether he was deserving of the same rights um, as a white person. Now, he shouldn't have to prove that because he was born in this land and his people had been in this land long before other people had come to the land that becomes the United States. But nevertheless, this is the legal system in which he finds himself, and he has to operate. On a witness chair, Standing Bear argued that he had long been walking the white man's road. He was a farmer. He had built a log house. He had even become a Christian. In my life, I cannot believe that Standing Bear would ever abandon his traditional belief because it was ingrained in all of our people in those days, even me. But I became a Christian, and I believe that Standing Bear accepted Christianity because it encompassed all of the teachings that our people had. I think he was trying to show that he could still live a civilized, life, but at the same time, he didn't have to give up being Ponca and who he was. He didn't want any tractors. He didn't want any handouts. He didn't want any welfare. He just wanted to go home and be a self-sufficient, independent farmer. The hours passed. The attorneys argued the fine points of the law in a language he didn't understand. Finally, Standing Bear had enough. They were the only tea. You brought me here. What have I done? It seems in this world I have nothing. After two days, Judge Dundee adjourned court. As Thomas Tibbles later wrote in his memoir, Standing Bear asked if he could make a final statement. He held out his hand and paused for a moment. Then he spoke directly to the judge. My hand is not the same color as yours. If I pierce it, I shall feel pain. If you pierce your hand, you too will feel pain. The blood that flows will be the same color. I am a man. The same God made us both. 
When he finished, there was a fairly long, hushed silence, and then you could begin to hear some, some sobbing, some crying coming from the back of the courthouse. The judge was emotionally overcome, and even General Crook. General Crook burst up from his bench and rushed over to Standing Bear to shake his hand. He was saying to the court and to the world, I'm a human being, respect me. This is the key to the whole thing, is a matter of respect. Judge Dundee adjourned court on a warm spring evening on the 2nd of May. He would spend the next 10 days pondering his decision. What exactly did it mean to be a person? The judge consulted a dictionary. Thank you, Nebraska Public Media, for that story. And thank you for watching. For more news and updates, visit us online at IndianCountryToday.com. On behalf of our news team here, have a safe weekend. And remember, Uma Umukatsi Ukalyani. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Thalahungva. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. Indian Country Today is produced at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. This is Indian Country Today.